Hello and welcome to the first episode of the 22 Grand Pod podcast. In this first episode, I'm talking to Tom Atkin of the Paddingtons. Tom seemed like a good place to start with the podcast, as not only were the Paddingtons a prevalent band from back in the day, but they're also from Hull, where I'm from, and I've got to know Tom over the years. Also, the idea is for Tom to come and co-host on later episodes and talk to some of the people he knows from back in the day. Tom was able to join me in lockdown from his home in East London, where he's able to take a break from homeschooling his daughter. I was locked down treating you and that. Oh, mate. Um, it's absolute fucking madhouse, yeah. That looks like a crash on Instagram. So the the, um, the neighbours next door, they're just like basically been swapping. <laughs> right. I mean, we're not, we're not doing very good uh, social distancing, but... <laughs> Have you taken any lessons yet? What, guitar lessons? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, where where do we start? I'd say like what year like what year did you get together and start? And why did you get um, into a band? Was it because of bands that were around at the time or was it because of bands that you're into growing up kind of thing? I think um we we started we started started a band because like I think because there there were there weren't really anything like new around at the time that we like properly got into music it was all it was all like stone roses and oasis and stuff that we were more obsessed with rather than like there was stuff like travis and star so at, yeah. at, at that time so it was like you know it was kind of like bedwetting music <laughs> <laughs> that's a keen album isn't it <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly it was like it was like keen but before then yeah, but, so it's just um, like the year 2000 kind of thing. Yeah, it was like really, yeah, like late 90s, early 2000s, there was just not not really anything going on. Yeah. And like all the music that we liked was like from the early to mid 90s, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So then, um, yeah, and then luckily, I, I guess, the Strokes came. That was That was like, we were already in a band. I guess we were already in a band like uh, at that time, and um, and then the strokes came out, and then it kind of changed everything because it, it 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 changed our style a little bit. Because I remember we we were playing like blue tone songs and stuff like that, right? And and like pixies and stuff, and not, obviously like pixies would have always been good and they always will be good. But then, and I guess I guess blue tones were as well. But you know they weren't as like cool, if you like. So it was yeah. just like it was like um, we'd we'd fuck around with Oasis songs, Blue Tones, and stuff like that. And then and then the Strokes came along and like changed everything, I guess. Like um, yeah, because even bands like the Libertines, like if you look back at what they were doing, like they were, their music was completely yeah. it was a lot softer, wasn't it? it wasn't anything. Don't worry, yeah, like mad yeah, suits exactly. and stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like the strokes changed. Obviously, the strokes changed everything. Like even like down to what people were wearing as well. Yeah. As soon as the stroke the strokes came out, like it was obviously bands were obviously already doing things. Like I'd love to know what like bands like Interpol and. I mean, loads of bands anyway. Yeah, like all those bands in New York. I'd love to know what they were doing before, like before, like the Strokes became popular. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, in Hull, you. Um, I think it's fair to say you you start to get more recognition than other people. Do you remember a point where you started to feel that way? You thought you yeah, were clearly doing something right here, kind of thing. Do it. There wasn't really anyone around, especially our age, like trying to be in a band. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we we started, I guess we just, we were into the cooler band at the time or whatever. Like we, we got into like this new wave of indie music that uh, was becoming popular again. Like, and it had gone from like Britpop to 
the back end of the 90s, whatever that was called, and then into like this early 2000s, noughties, the start of the, the noughties, you know? Yeah. But, um, and then, you know, then from that you had the Hives and Black Rebel, Libertines, like, I mean, yeah. the list goes on, doesn't it? There wasn't really many bands around Hull, especially at the time, uh, like in a, in our age bracket. Like the, the um, there was bands like the Raywells and some other bands that I don't even know to be honest. And they were all like classic rock bands, and it was like a bit of a different scene. And we were the younger kids coming out of it, and uh, you know we got into bands like the Strokes and the Hives and Black Rebel and all these like New York bands that were like creating this the start of the noughties, if you like. And then there was bands like the Libertines and it was all starting to kick off in the UK. And then, um, you know, we, we were kind of, we were lucky as, as well, just because of who we'd like bumped into along the way. Like we'd started doing, started doing like small gigs just playing cover cover songs in Hull mm. and then then we got offered like um we got offered a gig in Scarborough with Scarborough Steve oh yeah who, who was a guy who used to sing in the Libertines and like from there he he was like really excited to like introduce us to Pete and stuff and we were already fans of theirs anyway so obviously we we would do anything that we could to like um to go and play in London with like at whatever we could like it came down to the to like playing in someone's basement or like in a squat we played in a squat which um these portuguese these portuguese punks run this this um this squat in king's cross and they used to play like unlicensed gigs or whatever and it was like you know we thought it was cool because <laughs> it was like unlicensed and it was in London. And so we went and did that. And then, and then we got invited to play a gig in a basement with Pete, um, which actually never really happened. Pete ended up playing a set and we were meant to play a set after Pete. And then um, it got raided by the police. Was this so, on Carl's birthday by any chance? I've read about this, I think. Uh, or is that a different time where Pete was supposed to go to see Carl but on his birthday, but he arranged... Is it, was that the Gunter's Grove gig? Is it called the yeah, the, the, Gun, the Gunter Grove one, yeah. And it was like the Wolfman's flat or something. Yeah. You know, I can't really remember. But that was um, the start of it, was it? Too much detail. Yeah, but like, yeah, that was the first time that we got we got invited to play like a gig that we were really excited about, like outside of Hull, do you know what I mean? It was like, yeah. it was like our first, it was, it was our first thing that we'd, we'd ever really done, like off our own backs as well, like outside of Hull. Yeah. And then, um, but we didn't end up, we didn't even get to play because it got raided. Be we, we were like setting up or something and then <laughs> Pete was literally like, right, you need to grab all your stuff and you need to run because the police are at the door. Wow. It was, okay. it was like that. So then everybody just fucking ran. And um, I remember sitting, we'd, we'd driven down in a Nova. It was like <laughs> five of us in a, in a, in a Vauxhall Nova. And uh, I remember just getting out of this flat, being a little bit scared of like maybe getting arrested. <clears throat> and there was like, like people just doing drugs everywhere. Like, And we, you know, I think at the time we did we did speed and stuff like that. Mm. And we'd never really been introduced to taking anything else at this point. And I think there was people like jacking up in the corner, <laughs> which is wow. which is kind of weird to see like as a seventeen year old kid. Yeah. Um it was a bit weird, but I think it was quite exciting at the same time. It was a bit like we thought we were rock and roll for a minute. <laughs> yeah, and then from uh, there did it kind of accelerate after that kind of thing yeah and then and then we went home and then 
this, you know, we we uh, we'd post all the time on the libertines.org, which was like a forum uh, yeah. at the time, and that was where everything, you know, that's that's where you just used to hear about anything that was going on in London, basically. It was, there's loads of other bands as well. I can't really m- remember who was like coming out at that point, but there was the the others were probably somewhere in there. And, yeah. Uh, and the unstrong bands like that, mm. and uh, selfish cunt. <laughs> um, let me think. Were they um, all kind of in and around the liberty? Yeah. The, the, yeah. Okay. I get, um, yeah. That, I don't know if like no nobody really had any involvement with each other at that point, but okay. like it was like what was going on in London, and then I I, I have no idea how, how it all came together. Yeah, but um, they um, but then uh, a night got put on at the Rhythm Factory, which was like in Whitechapel, mm. and. Um, we got invited to do that and that was a libertines thing and it was like it was an all nighter right and it was they used to call it bring your own poison i'm not sure if it got it had got the name at this point but like the first one of the, one of the first gigs that we did which was after the squat gig and after the um the one at gunter grove so yeah. we got invited to play another one which was it was like a bit of an all night. There was loads more bands. It was like a proper venue. And like, we didn't end up playing until, until like three in the morning. Uh, I think the, Liber- the Libertines played at midnight and there was bands on before and there was bands on after. We ended right. up playing after the Libertines, which we thought was really weird because we were just like, sure, the people <laughs> are going to like, we're just going to fuck off her more. Yeah, yeah. You know? <clears throat> but then, um, yeah, so we ended up, we ended up playing at three in the morning and Alan McGee was there. Ah, uh, right, okay. And that that was where that was where McGee that was where we first me, uh, met McGee. Yeah. And uh he, And he's he sober at this at, point, is he? Um oh, yeah, he, I, I, that's a bit mad, I isn't think, it? <laughs> I think so. I think he was still a bit bonkers, but Yeah. I think he's still bonkers now, to be honest. <laughs> uh I'm not sure if he was sober at this point. But that's where I first met him, and he said, "I remember him coming up to me, and and like, you know, I was pretty fucked as well. We just we we just played a gig. We didn't play many songs. We probably played like five five songs or something. Yeah, and probably it's probably a cover in there somewhere as well. And we probably had like four or five of our own songs, and then." He'd come up to me and said, um, uh, what, did, "What did he say?" He, I think he was pretty much like, "Fucking loved your set." Um, in his in his Scottish accent, he was like, "Fucking love your set, hey." Uh, <laughs> I, I want to do a deal, right? And it, <laughs> Very direct. He was like, he was pretty much straight away. He was like, "Yeah." Um, I want to. I want to release. He knew what song he wanted to do as well straight away. Right. And it was twenty one, and he was like, "Have you got a recording of this song?" And he was like, he was trying to explain, um, trying to explain like what song it was. And I was like, "We only have. We only really have like one recording." Yeah. Um. And he was like, "Yeah, let's put it out. Like, let's let's just let's just put it out there as it is." Right. And. And it was pretty, it was shit. Like the recording that we had was like a really, really bad demo. I mean, look, we ended up recording another one purposely for him to put out, but I don't think that was much better either. But um, the one that we did have was like, you know, it was fucking pretty bad. Yeah. And so we went home, we, rec- we re-recorded it, and then he, he, re- he released that. He, he released the one that we uh, we recorded, and then um, oh, was this pop then, turns at the time? Was it? He, yeah, so yeah. that that was pop turns. Did it turn out? Well, how did he? Was McGee pretty keen to get an album out? Then was he kind of like he, he, that? Was, I don't think. I don't think that. I don't think it was ever really 
I'm not sure if it was his plan to like release an album with us, but right. he um, he was just always like, yeah, I'd like to put a single or, or maybe two out on because his level, the Pop Turns level, was just a little thing that he had going okay, after yeah. creation. So it was just like a little label that it started. Yeah. Uh, and after that. Because it did, it did quite well. Like we went top forty with that. Yeah, that's uh, pretty good. Isn't it? And and like no one was really expecting it. Like yeah, and we had we had like we had like quite a big buzz going on around us because of like the whole scene. Like yeah, that whole just everything what was going on was like it. It was just there was just a, a massive buzz around around the whole thing, and there's there was like a few brand like us and the others and Libertines. Um, and the the hives the hives were signed to pop turns as well. All oh, right, happens to be massive. Uh, yeah, so that, I think they were like the big band, and then there was like Boxer Rebellion. Oh yeah, I think Special Needs were signed to them as well. Okay. Uh, and then <clears throat> after that, so we went top forty with the single from with the 21 single what with we the bad top, recording yeah the single version that we we re-recorded it i don't know what it even sounded like before we re-recorded it yeah it must have been bad um yeah so the the one that we re-recorded that went like top 40 i think and after that there was like the whole buzz that was going on and then uh mercury i think and then mercury got in touch with mcgee and was like we want to sign, want to sign them for a five album deal, and that's where it like five album. Wow! It, so it started after, started after that, really. So, in, so between releasing that single and releasing the album, obviously you went top forty. So, like, things started to change pretty fast, kind of thing. Yeah, and basically. Um, we were just constantly touring around the whole thing as well. Like we we didn't really stop playing gigs. Yeah. And then we got, and then we got put on, then we got put on like a proper tour. And we 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 made this tour around that, and it was like, it was us. It was like a camping tour. Right. So there was us and the unstrung, and we like went around and we just in cars and. Just we camped out in fields All right. <laughs> and played gigs wherever we could, whoever would have it. We like we'd end up playing in we, we played in a fucking beef eater once in like <laughs> Wolverhampton or something. Yeah. <laughs> so like we we ended up playing in well it was Wolverhampton like beef eater and <laughs> we were literally crowds there was like kids crowd surfing. There weren't like loads of people there, but like it was like crowd surfing like tables around us I'm sure people I'm sure people were trying to eat like a Sunday roast <laughs> yeah. Carvery's going everywhere <laughs> fucking Yorkshire puddings coming out my ears what so what you were you kind of arranged with the Unstrung tr- to travel before you'd even booked any gigs yeah we yeah so like we um, yeah we'd find like camp nearby campsites and like book onto them yeah go and do a gig pack up the cars with, like, drum kits and stuff. I think we all shared kit as well. All right. So it was like we had one drum kit and then, like, amps and guitars. Sure. Yeah. We must, have, we must have all shared stuff oh, pretty much. Um, and then, and then, uh, yeah, and then we'd, then we'd just go find a campsite and fucking cause trouble. <laughs> I, 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 remember, I remember we'd, like, lock up at this campsite and this guy was just like oh shit and just like who the fuck are all these like who are all the, and like some of some of like the fans right if you like if you like to call them fans <laughs> at the time yeah like you know the entourage was like um they'd come they'd come and camp with us as well right so they just we'd just turn up at these campsites and uh yeah, the owner of the campsite has just been like, for fuck's sake, like, they just look, I think we'd like all just get back to the campsite, double drop some pills and like run around like chasing, chasing cows. 
I, 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 I vaguely remember like chasing a cow where he pulled up, um, just <laughs> covered in cow Fuck shit. Around. <laughs> yeah, rolling around in cow shit on ecstasy. Lovely stuff. Um, so how long until you recorded the album after that then? Um, that must have been about 2004. Okay. So you had Stephen Street producing it, didn't you? Who did he produce Blair? No, he... no. We, we we did we did a we did a single with Stephen Street. Ah, okay. And we did a single with Owen Morris. Owen Morris, that's it. And he he produced definitely maybe. Yeah. So yeah. we had yeah, Stephen Street who'd, who'd done he'd done some of Blair and Smiths as well, I think. Oh uh, yeah. So he'd done some like. Yeah, he'd done that side of it, and then we had Owen Morris who'd done like the Verve, Evan Hymns, and definitely maybe and stuff Not like bad. that. Yeah. So, yeah, it, the connection between McGee and Owen Morris is really good for us because we we recorded Panic Attack first of all. Right. <clears throat> so what happened was um, Owen Morris had agreed to like. He, he was really into it and he was obviously mates with McGee. He was like, yeah, I definitely want to do it. And um, I think what happened was we went to do, we went to record Panic Attack. We just did a single because we, we, we chose a single, basically. We chose that Panic Attack was going to be like our big single. Yeah. Or our first one anyway, after 21. So yeah. like we'd released 21 and then we had to choose a single to go and do with Owen Morris. It was kind of like a bit of a test, like to see if we worked well together and like uh, okay, see right. if it see if it was going to be too mental because like he had a bit of a reputation and I guess we kind of did as well. And and the label, the, I think the label were a bit like they were a bit worried about it or something like that. So we were like we'll put you in, put you in to go and do like one song with him. Right. So we went and did one song um, in this studio in in Hastings, and we we went and did that, and it was it was yeah it was really good. Um, I don't think we'd you know we hadn't really tested the water properly to be honest because we weren't with him long enough for it to go wrong anywhere. Okay. <clears throat> but um, it went really well, and then uh, you know we got on with him and. We just we liked him anyway because of like his past, obviously like his production. The sound of like definitely maybe for us was like, you know, it's kind of it's exactly what we wanted because we were quite loud, yeah, and like, you know, we wanted it to be quite aggressive and like we wanted it to sound massive. As, yeah, as I'm sure everybody wants their album to sound big, but you, you know, like. It suited your style, well, kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Like it really suited what we wanted out of our debut album, anyway. Yeah. So it was like, um, so yeah, we did Panic Attack and and loved it. And then after that, the label like kind of trusted us and McGee for some reason. I mean, I <laughs> guess, I guess, I guess they had to trust what we wanted to do and like we needed to be happy at the same time as like also making the right album. But yeah, nobody he had a good track he, record. Then. I think, yeah, McGee had a good track record, even though he was a bit off his head like yeah. in the nineties, you know, but um, I guess like, I guess it's all a bit of a gamble anyway. Yeah. yeah. Nobody really knows what's going to happen. Like it's same with management. Like, when when you're trying to go with anyone, you don't. When you you know like when you first meet these people, like they can convince you that it's going to work, but you you never know what's going to happen until you've done it. Yeah. But anyway, like I, I don't regret going with Owen Morris because it was like uh, we we were we were really happy at the end of it. We were really happy with how it sounded, and we had a bit. You know the the whole experience was a bit fucked up, not fucked up. Yeah, I mm. guess it was. I guess was it was. just with Panic Attack or the whole album. 
No, this would yeah, with panic attack, but then like going on from panic going from panic attack and doing the whole album, we end up doing the full album with with uh, Owen Morris. Yeah, oh, right, okay. And yeah, so doing like the doing the album with him was was a bit mental to be fair. And I've so I'm sure I've, I've saw Marv post something about saying how mental it was, like he was you sticking someone's head down the toilet while recording or something. Is that Owen Morris? <laughs> Yeah, I, there was a few different things that we tried out. Um, I don't think any any of them were particularly normal either. <laughs> but, uh, but, but did he used to get you hammered as well before he recorded? Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a sober note on the album. For me. <laughs> like, I, like the first day that we met him, we met him in a pub like down the road from the studio in Hastings. It was like it was in the middle of nowhere. So this the studio was in the middle of nowhere, and then this pub that was like. 15 minute drive away was like the first like place you know like it was the only pub like in the area and it was like you couldn't really walk there yeah but so like we were pretty deserted but and that was like the aim it was like right if we if we get put in the middle of nowhere with no distractions and it's going to be fine and like you know we're not what can go wrong kind of thing but yeah, I think it kind of backfired a, a little bit because we went a bit more insane because <laughs> we had nothing else to do. Okay. Even though we were there to, to record an album, we still needed other, th- you know, like yeah. Because I guess there's we, long periods where individuals yeah, the, are not doing anything. Yeah, exactly. Like we would, um, we met him in the pub, and. He put his gold card behind the bar and he was like, right, I'm going to put this card behind the bar for for the for the, fu- for the foreseeable future that we're going to be in the shoot. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. This, he was like, basically, my gold card's going to go behind the bar the whole time that we're in the studio and we're going to start every day in the pub. And basically, we, we met him... Like, I remember on the first day, I think we just went to the pub at like nine in the morning, didn't really have breakfast. We just got straight on it, right. um, straight on the booze. And then, and then we realized that he'd driven his car to the, he'd driven his car to the pub. He had like this massive jag and we'd right. all got in the car and then he'd got absolutely smashed, couldn't drive his car. <laughs> so we'd been there for a couple of hours and he... <clears throat> he was too pissed to drive his car back, so I can't remember. I think it was I think it was Marv. Marv drove his car back. Marv <laughs> didn't even have a license, and I think he was half cut as well. So it was like we drove drove his car back. We'd all got a bit pissed, and then it was like time to like set up and start working. Yeah, and we started to live track. We started to track everything live. Um, at first, basically, it was all. I think, yeah, we tracked every song live, and that's how it started. But, um, you know, there was different ways of going around doing vocals, and there was, you know, it it get us all on our own. Everything was tracked, mm. and then and then he'd obviously take us all off to do like individual parts, and it and he'd have his own little way with like working with each of us. Yeah. Um, and I remember when I when I was doing vocals, it was like um, he sent everybody else to bed. Basically, he was like, "I don't want anyone in the studio while while he was working with me." Right. And he like, yeah, he, he he was just like he was quite strict on that. He just wanted everyone to fuck off, basically, because I think we'd all started doing each other's heads in like even after a week. So it was <laughs> it was like. We'd we'd got like all the drugs in at the beginning of the week, right? And he, you know, he wanted to get off his head as much as we did, probably yeah. more, in fact. But um, <clears throat> so everybody had gone to bed, and he, uh, it was just me and him, and he, and he got these pills out, and they were they were bright blue. Remember, remember in the noughties when we had blue pills. <laughs> I was about ten. And, 
Um, so yeah, so uh, so he gets these he gets these blue pills out and crushes them up, and he's like, right, what we're going to do is we're going to snort all these pills before we start doing anything. <laughs> so I was like, okay, good start. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I was up for it. I was, <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, you know. Don't get me wrong, yeah, I was bang up for it. Yeah. <laughs> we used to love doing pills, so it was it was like like a little treat. Um, and he he was snorting these pills, being sick at the same time in a bin. Jesus. Next Christ. to the next to the control room, and he was just looking at me and there, uh, and he was like, "And I, I to be fair, I was snorting the pills, but I wasn't being sick." <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I, <laughs> I was. Uh, I was pretty. I was fucking flying to be fair, and I was just like, <laughs> and he was like, right, and he was like, get. We, we started with twenty one as well, so like the album version was different to, um, yeah, the single version. Obviously, like that was a bit shit, and we did like a longer album version, it's a lot better. But um, yeah, basically, he just stuck me in this control room, absolutely pilled out my head with like blue stuff all over my face, right. <laughs> and he's he's looking at me. And like, no, I couldn't even see him. I don't think I could see him. <laughs> so like, he's he's put me in. He's sat in the control room, and I'm in I'm in like this booth that we'd made in the live room. It's like a right. massive live room, and I'm just doing take after take for like a couple of hours. And like, you know, these these pills have really kicked my head in. So like, I'm like just I'm just nonstop doing takes on twenty one. Yeah, and he's just and like. And he's like not really doing anything, and he's just going, "Yeah, do another one." And he just pre- and, and and I think I was just on loop, and he was like, "Yeah, just keep going." And then I go back in the room after about two hours, and he sat there, and he's got this this girl on his knee. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I I go back. He's got this fit twenty five year old on his knee called Spice, right? And he's like, "It's funny that you remember all this." Yeah, I, do you know? I, I, I don't know why, I never forgot her name. But yeah, she, he was like, Yeah, Tom, this is Spice. And I was like, Right, how's it going? And I'm like, Absolutely off my head. <laughs> just like thinking, just looking at him, looking at her, going, What, what who's, who's this? And, and he's like, Yeah, you're done now anyway, you can go to bed. And I'm like, Right, <laughs> sweet. So, was that yes. how the rest of the album was done then? In terms so, of vocals, that was that was like that was just the start of the vocals. Ah, uh, right, okay. I don't, I don't think we did that on every song. To be honest, like I think we did actually record some in daytime as well. That must have been like, I think that must have been about eleven, twelve at night. That and we and we worked until like two or three in the morning. Yeah, on that song, but we did do some like evening sessions on the vocals as well, and there were there were some more normal like takes on songs and stuff obviously like but yeah. it, it, even if you listen to 21 at the beginning you can kind of tell that i'm a bit i'm a bit wavy <laughs> <laughs> yeah the whole album's like that but it all like fits together <laughs> doesn't it <laughs> yeah like it all makes sense in the end like when when it when we finished it it did it was like oh yeah i think i think we're happy with that even though it was a bit you can tell because like, he's kept stuff in the album where like you're just chatting before songs and stuff yeah, exactly. It's kept in the like, songs, kind of like to make it a bit. If you listen to 21 at the beginning, it's like I'm basically just screaming. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm not I'm not very well. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously the album comes out and then you're finding yourselves on like proper tour buses and all that. Like, how yeah, was all that? that? Was, that was when... Yeah, because 21, um, not 21, Panic Attack uh, got to like number 21 in the charts as well. So that yeah, <clears throat> that was quite a high chart position for a band like us, I think, at the time. You know, like we were fucking buzzing with that. Definitely, and yeah. We, yeah, and we were like, we, we were gutted that we didn't get top 20 because that was like top of, the, top of the pops was still around then and we could, not that we'd have got on it, but we might, you know, we'd have had yeah. a chance. That would have been... Uh, that would have been quite a good one. But, um, yeah, I think it went 21 in the charts. And then... Was that kind of the peak then? Was that... Like... Yeah, I think that, that that was that was our peak. Right. That was where 
you know, and our album sold pretty well as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so after 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 Panic Attack came out, that was like our that was our big one, and we got we'd we'd got a proper fan base then as well. It was like it wasn't just like these kids on the forum anymore. It was like we were selling quite a lot of copies and like we, we were yeah. selling out yeah like headline selling, tours and stuff yeah we sold out like most of our tours as well so like yeah. it had like it had turned like proper if you like and yeah like you say we'd got we got put on tour buses and so i guess at doing... that point when you're thinking i suppose at that point you got a five album deal you're kind of thinking yeah just like bring it on kind of thing you're not really worried about what's going to happen yeah, and it, honestly, like I wish I'd have taken a little bit more time. I don't really have any regrets, but I wish I'd have taken a little step back and, like, actually, I don't know, concentrate I know what you mean, more. Yeah. I think, like, we got we got caught up in it all, and we we were just constantly touring, and we just wanted to party and tour and play shows. Yeah. We should have probably concentrated a bit more on like making a better album for the next one and like making more songs and like trying to plan get into like the fifth album rather than like just thinking oh yeah we've got you know because we I think we just kind of sat on our first album and was like right we've got an album now but you know it was a lot more than that yeah yeah um, it was a lot yeah we 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 wrote like well, it seemed to me like from like an outsider's point of view, it seemed like you had the songs ready to go for the second album, but the record company was stalling it, or is that not right? Um, to tell you the truth, I don't, I don't remember. I think you we had quite a lot of new songs on. Yeah, on we, tour. We, we had this batch of songs, yeah. which we thought was going to be our second album, but then we took that long. Like I, I can't remember if it was the label or, or what. It was probably it's probably a combination between us and the label, like just not kicking us up the ass and like and management as well because we we like um, we'd gone from like having one of our friends' managers in Hull, yeah, kind of thing, and it was like you know we needed like he did a pretty good job to be fair, and like it was what it was at the time, but now. Now that we were doing like these big tours, we needed somebody who was more experienced. So like, yeah, we we did change management, and um, yeah, I guess it was like label management and us that fucked around a bit. Um, getting because we b- before we had proper management, we had <clears throat> we already had a deal. Okay, so it was like it was a bit of a weird one because you know you, you manager usually gets your deal and then they take. You know. Oh, okay, right. That it was like we we already we'd already got signed on our own, if you yeah. like, before having like a proper manager. And so then, what happened? Um, did Mercury kind of did their money disappear kind of thing? Is that no, what happened? No. What, what what the money for the album? I thought it's kinda of like they're they're having problems and then you were able to record. No, no, I think we, we messed around a lot. Uh, right. Like this yeah. batch of we we messed around. With, we like messed around with this first batch of songs, and then when it came to recording the album, we already had like a bunch of other songs. So like we were all over the place, and we didn't know what songs to use. And then uh, we did okay. pr- pre-production for the second album, and it all changed. Like, um, you know, we we'd we'd like sacked some songs off, which. <laughs> Like we probably should have stayed on the album and stuff like that. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say, but like, um, you kind of yeah, you, you kind of wish you'd released the second album in a similar style to the first. Yeah, to be honest, I wish we'd have done just a bit sooner. Kind of. Yeah, I wish we'd have done. We we should have done it a lot sooner, and we um, we didn't go with Owen on the second album. And in in a way, I kind of wish we had it done because it. it I don't know. I don't really that was know. your style, wasn't it? I think, yeah. Yeah, and it had come out a bit different to... Because the, the second album was, like, completely sober as well. Yeah, yeah. So I don't like, know if it was you or Josh we, was saying that you got him, 
he got him in on recommendation that he was a bit of a madhead and it turned out he's, he'd gone sober in the meantime or something. Well, what, Owen? No, you're the new producer for the second yeah, album. Yeah, 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 that was it, yeah. With uh, Tony Dugan, he was called, um, he, he, was a re- he, was, he was good actually, like, we, 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 um, it was really good, like, working with him, but it was just complete, it was a, comp- we'd all changed a bit as well. Yeah, because like, this what, so you released that first album in 2005, sat recording yeah. this in 2007, was it? Yeah, so yeah. We'd, we'd, we'd only just started recording it in 2007 where we probably should have been releasing it in 2007. Yeah. Uh, I think we might have released it in 2007, but we we took, it should have been, it should have been sooner than it was basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah, so, so we did the second album with Tony Dugan who we'd, it would been recommended and like we'd, we were in. I was into like some of the stuff that he'd done previous as well. Like he right. worked with Mog. He worked with Mogwai a lot, and was quite into that at the time. Yeah. Uh, or I was getting into that kind of thing, and um, I don't know. He just he seemed quite fitting, but it was a, it was a different experience um, working with him because by the time we'd got working with him, he'd he'd come he'd become sober and yeah. You know, we like to get in fucked. <laughs> um, was this? Did it end up coming out on your own record label? Or, yeah, so we went. We went in the studio with a label, right? Recording it. By the end of, we lived in Glasgow for like three months or something, recording it. And yeah. uh, by the end of the by the end of the session, uh, we got dropped. So oh, okay. We had investors help us finish it, and then we ended up releasing it on our own, yeah. Yeah, because I guess that's quite a good... So obviously, if you carry on this podcast, that's kind of what I want to look at, is that how it's different for bands now. And I guess you were there in that transition period where it became a lot harder for bands to maintain a record label or get a record label. Mm. So do you think that's, do you think that's the case now? It's just a lot harder, or... It's just not the same landscape anymore. Yeah. Where you, like a band like you now, would struggle to get in the top twenty, wouldn't they? Like, or get to twenty-one like you did. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, even though I think the charts nowadays are, um, are a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's different lot, in it, but it, it, it's very like everything's different, and it'd be hard to say. But um, I think, I think we, uh, yeah, it's really hard to like. To compare it because, yeah, like nowadays, things things are easier. To, things are definitely easier um, to do things on your own. Yeah, because of every, you know, I mean, you can do anything on your own pretty much now. Like you, you can record your own albums if you want on your own. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, and you've got like so many different platforms to like. Um, to like sell yourself on or whatever. Mm. I guess is it monetizing it? Where's the problem comes in? Yeah, like, but the different, but coming out of coming out of, like, physical sales and like how we used to work and how we used to, like, at the platform like we used to, um, you know, sell on. Coming out of that and like changing and like trying to do it ourselves and like. Not have the not having the same team behind us and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I guess it was like it was a bit of a shock to us, and we didn't really know what we were doing. Yeah, um, yeah. Whereas I think it's you know it's more common these days, and like people have a lot more knowledge on like doing it themselves. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's what I'd be interested to know. So obviously, when you got signed, you got given that advance and stuff, which you can understand that gives you like the ability to, uh, you know, write more songs uh, yeah. and, g- and gives you that breathing space. Where as I don't understand now how bands, how bands don't get advances like that now, do they? Yeah, I think having yeah, I think having the advance was definitely, you know, nowadays people do, don't get advances like they used to, and yeah. having having an advance for every album like back in like 2005 yeah compared to now 
like obviously they don't give money out like they used to and like yeah it it doesn't I guess it was more relaxed then and like you say it just it gives you a lot more breathing space to be able to do what you want yeah um, okay just some like general questions to finish on I guess so like who were like your favourite bands in that area like you, you formed like quite quite a close bond with the Cribs didn't you obviously the Strokes were like my first like yeah the, the strokes were like the strokes changed everything for music back then and like um they were they're probably like one of my favorite bands ever do you know but yeah but but the cribs the cribs would the cribs were like kind of different to everyone for me like i think because they were they were from wakefield which wasn't like really f- far away from where we were from and like they were kind of like the british strokes for me they yeah. sounded. They sounded how I want. If I wanted to be in a band, if I was gonna, I think if I wanted to, if I was gonna be in a band mm. that wasn't that wasn't my band, I think I'd want it to sound like the Cribs. Like everything about the Cribs was just appealing to me. Like just even the fact that they were brothers as well, yeah. and even two of them being twins. Like there was something about the Cribs that was just real unique and like just special if you like <laughs> yeah yeah i think they are unique because like they're still they're at that level where they can just play at ace venues they don't play stadiums and they don't need to yeah they like, don't get many bands that like stay on that level do you no like the, the cribs like smashed it like yeah like what the, what they've done like even to this day like you know they're one of the only bands that are still going from that from that time, like, and that scene, yeah. you know, like, and they've, they've maintained this, like, iconic, like, um, fan base where people just are obsessed with them. Yeah, yeah. And, like, like... They're almost like know, a cult band, they, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah exactly. And they're, they're, they're the most underrated band to ever come out of, like, Britain in the past 15 years for me. Yeah, like, yeah. 100% they should... It's, it's it's actually really nice that they're not like too mainstream. Because, I think that you know, definitely. Is. So, sometimes you fall out of love with like some band. Like, do you know Biffy Clara used to quite like some of their early stuff, and like they went, they're they're an example. Like they went a bit mainstream, and I kind of fell out of love with some of their songs. Do you know mm. what I mean? Well, that's the interesting the thing crib. about um, a Meet Me in the Bathroom book. Yeah. A lot of people in there were like, oh, it's a real shame the Strokes didn't get to the level of uh, the Killers and Kings of Leon. It's like, well, I'd hate it if no. the Strokes released a Sex on Fire. It'd be awful. Yeah, exactly. We, we, we wouldn't have liked it. No. no. And like, I think, I think I still love the, the Strokes as much as I do for that reason. Yeah, And, and the same, same with the Cribs. Like, they, they got to a level where I think, you know, you, you kind of like... They deserve to be bigger than this, but I also don't want them to be bigger than this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they can, they'll be able to play shows for the rest of their lives. Like, and they'll have like, they even like appeal to like the younger generation now. I think like, yeah. The the cribs will still have like a, a young that, uh, fan base now. I think I know it's about strokes because like there's people at like in the teen in the teens and like twenties. But yeah, that strokes exactly. agree. Went to another one. That's pretty yes, to be fair. Yeah, exactly. Like the teenagers still get into like the the, the cool, like the, the best bands. Yeah, um, like, the, like the Cribs and Strokes. Okay, and then one to finish on. I'm going to try and ask everyone if we carry on the podcast. <laughs> uh, I know you've got a couple of them, but have you got a good Liam Gallagher story for us? Uh. Yeah, I've got a few to be honest. <laughs> um, they're all pretty good. Uh, I'll I'll tell one. Okay. There's one. There's one about. Um, so basically, we had like this weird relate. Do you know what? I've always loved Liam. Like he's been one of my icons. Like since I was about fourteen. Yeah. And like I have always loved him, and I love the fact that he's a bit of a knobhead. Even though even though he's less of a knobhead nowadays, but. You know, like he was always a bit of a dick, and yeah, yeah, I think that's why people loved him, right? And because he's probably one of the best 
front man in the world. But, mm. um, yeah, he slagged us off once in the papers and we had this, like, we had this bit of a back yeah. and forth, yeah. And so one night I was out with, uh, I was out with Carl Barat and... Uh, there was a few others. One of my mates, one of my mates called Buckchank, who's from Hull, <clears throat> and he, um, Liam was with us, and we was in the Holy Arms, like on the roof, and Liam, Liam stood next to me, and we're all just sat, stood having a cig, and Liam just starts like he starts nipping me on my side, and he's like pinching me, and like he's looking at me going. Uh, then you're in fucking big trouble, you are. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, like I'm like giggling, like a bit nervous, like, okay, you know, Liam Gallagher is like, what's he on about? <laughs> so he's like, he um he just keeps nipping me. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I was like, you're all right. And he's like, <laughs> Well, you know, you've been fucking slagging me off. I was like, Well, let's be honest. I was like, you started it, didn't you? And you know. We we're only having a laugh. I was like, I love you, really. And he's like, you're in fucking big trouble, you are. And he's like, he's basically threatening me and he's, <clears throat> he's making out he's going to bang me out. Right. And and so in the end, like, I just like entertain it a little bit and I didn't really want to have a fight because I probably got knocked out. But um, he, and then my mate follows him and follows him into the toilet and um he's he's like he needs he, he basically my mate like threatens him a little bit and says look I'm if you if you carry on I'm gonna fucking knock you out <laughs> and then uh so Liam comes back comes back out from the toilet and he I think he, I can't remember who was I think it's Nicole Appleton who was with at the time. Yeah. And and she's sat on the, like a table in the garden and he's like he kind of just goes over and says, right, come on, we have to leave. And, <laughs> and then he left. And that was the end of that. But, well, um, you made a bit of a, a hard case or what? N- n- not really. I th- he was a bit bigger than Liam, though. He was a rugby player, so... Uh, okay, right. He, um, yeah, I think he just shut him up a bit. He yeah, would have yeah. probably knocked Liam out as well, but... <laughs> That's uh, just a bookshelf. I'm, 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 quite, I'm, quite, I'm quite glad that he didn't, to be fair. <laughs> 